All right, how's everyone doing? Good, good. I get to be second, that's good. You already warmed up. Uh, yeah, so I'm Paul. I'm a product manager. I work on Gmail. I've been on Gmail for about two years. Um, this is our agenda. We're going to talk about uh, specifically the case study of Smart Compose in Gmail. I'm going to tell you the story about how we built that product uh, or feature. Then I'm going to step back and tell you some general strategies we've learned building AI and ML products at, uh, on Gmail overall. And then hopefully we'll have some time for uh, questions. Sounds good? Um, Hopefully everyone here knows what Gmail is, but in case you don't, uh, we are the world's largest email product. We're, we have 1.5 billion users, uh, we're 15 years old. Uh, fun fact, we launched on April Fool's Day. Uh, another fun fact, um, and I only recently learned this because we had our 15th birthday celebration, the product was within days of being killed a year after it launched because uh, traction wasn't what they thought it was gonna be. There were lots of signups uh, pending. I don't know if you remember, there was an invite uh, thing you had to share. Um, but the, the cost was so high to, 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 do a, to, to keep everyone's email, and we couldn't see any business model there that they almost killed it. Obviously, way before my time. Good thing we didn't. Um, anyways, so we'll get to the topic here, Smart Compose. Who here has written an email in the last 24 hours? OK, some people don't have their hands up. I don't believe them. Um, basically, everybody writes email. Uh, so this is from a McKinsey study. Over, 25, over a quarter of a worker's day is spent in their email. And uh, that's a lot of time. And of course, when we're looking for high impact user problems that we want to solve, uh, we are going to address the biggest chunk of that, which actually writing emails. Of course, writing an email takes a lot longer than reading an email. And the story of Smart Compose really starts with Smart Reply, which was uh, a feature we originally launched in Inbox, which was a, a sort of experimental email platform we had for a while. So it's so three blue boxes at the bottom that pre-compose replies for inbound mail. Uh, Smart Replies has, has performed really well for us. 10% of all replies sent from mobile are sent from Smart Reply. Uh, it saves about a minute on time, maybe on average, but as long as we take you to write, you know, sure what time, and now you can just go tap, tap. So that's, that's pretty good savings. Um, so we, we brought this from inbox to Gmail about two, two and a half years ago. It was actually my starter project. And Landed pretty well. Here's a quote from Forbes. Uh, it's one of those features that you find yourself using more and more until you're annoyed at an app that doesn't have it. Uh, so this is great. Obviously, Matt is ha happy to see that reception. And I saw this headline, and it said, never type an email again with Smart Reply for Gmail on iOS and Android. And part of me was like, yeah, I just want to like, sit back and be like, that's, that's great. But of course, I know that's not true, right? Because most emails are not uh, only five words long. And also, um, most uh, we write a lot of emails that aren't just replies. So of course, Smart Reply doesn't work for originals, and it doesn't work for, for longer emails. Uh, it is great for its niche and its use case, and, and it does a really, really good job there. Uh, but we wanted to, to, to do more and go beyond that. So we looked at how the high impact user problems we could solve. And we also found that professional emails, so these are generally things that are sent to a whole company, or if there's any status differentials to people send, sending to their boss, if it's a student, to their professor. These are the ones that really are anxiety inducing and people uh, have the most trouble with. And of course, these also tend to be longer. Um, so we looked around the company and said, how can we uh, use language completion all over the place, and what are some patterns we can reuse there? And we saw this one. So you guys have probably all use this. This is autocomplete on uh, Google Search. It saves 250 hours a day uh, per around the world of, of typing. So that's three human lifetimes every day saved by this feature alone. Uh, so that's a pretty high bar, um, and that was that was our inspiration. So we had to ask ourselves, what would happen if we could build autocomplete for email? And this is much more challenging because it's completely unconstrained. Queries are fairly constrained. They're pretty short. We have a long database history of what's been searched. Uh, there's also autocomplete in code editors, if any of you have done coding. It's a very structured environment. Programming languages are very predictable. Um, so this is the actual slide that we, we had in our very first sort of pitch meeting for this, before we had uh, any designs, any modeling built. Um, and our goal was to build the world's first general purpose phrase autocomplete. So that's what I mean by general purpose, it's freeform. We wanted to, and there's a lot of text here, but uh, on, the, on the second paragraph there, we wanted to help users translate their thoughts into appropriate language with lower effort, greater efficiency. So this is sort of the vision. How do we make uh, language available to users' fingertips before they were going to write it, save people time, get people uh, more, more uh, you know, back, back into the stuff that they're, they're wanting to spend their time on? This is the first tool we built. 
So the, 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 the takeaway here is that we wanted to move really quickly. We want to test our ideas. Uh, this is just a standalone website. And what we actually did was we took the smart reply model and we uh, put it into the standalone website and just to see if as you typed there was any, any kind of magic there. So if I write, wrote sure, so it's, this is an email, right? Taco party with a message. We generate a bunch of smart replies for that. We usually show the first three in those blue boxes. So we plugged in them all directly, got a list of all of them, and we sort of drilled down on the smart replies as you type. Of course, it would run out as soon as you wrote more than four words, but we got to feel if there was like any kind of magic there, um, and it felt pretty good. People, uh, this is just internally, like uh, me and a couple engineers uh, playing with this, and, and we thought it was pretty good. This was probably about two weeks after that last slide, so this is a pretty quick turnaround. We said, okay, there might be something here. Let's see if we can design a user experience that would pair with this that we could then start to build a, a feature and test it. Um, so we did this user study. There's three basic patterns that we could identify for dropdown. We look around. So the first one is dropdown. That's what we have in search on Google.com. Use it for most search patterns. It's on YouTube. Uh, so it's very uh, familiar. We thought it would do well. Um, there's chips, which is kind of like dropdown, but down at the bottom. This is basically smart reply. The smart reply was working really well for us. So we said, hey, why don't we take that same pattern and see if it would apply here? And then uh, the third one, called type ahead, which is just let's have some gray text uh, that sort of suggests, you know, show what we might suggest. And this one is hard for us as engineers because you can't be wrong, right? We can only show you one suggestion versus the other two have uh, three. So um, this feature has been out for a while, so you probably know where we landed. But in this study, who do you think, or just put your hand up if you think drop down performed best, the familiar one from search. Nobody. This is, I've given this talk three times. First time nobody's put their hand up. So I'm going to have to stop doing this. Um, <laughs> uh, chips. Anyone think chips did best? OK. OK. There we go. We have some, some chip supporters. Um, and then, of course, type ahead is the rest. People? Yeah. OK. So type, type it did well. Um, so let me tell you what actually happened. Drop down. Um, it, it, it didn't do great because what actually happens is when you put this on screen in the middle of somebody's thinking, is it interrupts them. It's very distracting. So there's a bunch of UI that wasn't there before. And not only that, they uh, have to process all three responses. So they actually brought, broken out of the train of thought of what they're trying to write and now reading what you've presented them. And, and it actually ends up taking more time, which is obviously very, very counter, uh, counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, so this did not perform well. Chips is the same, but way, way worse. So people did not know how to accept this. They'd go to their mouse and like go down and click it. It was taking like orders of magnitude more time. Chips bombed completely. Um, and I think the main difference there is that this is something that's done in the moment versus smart reply is is very sort of transactional, right? You're already going to click reply. You're going to do you're going to do this one one moment where uh, in smart reply we're sort of. Uh, it's not additional because you're going to click the reply button anyways. You have to make that moment. Um, here, here it's, it's, it's inter interruptive. So type ahead um, performed the best. And I think the, the, the main learning from this is how important distraction was and how we had to minimize that. So we had a UI that we thought we could iterate with. And we had a model, sort of. We had that smart reply model that uh, we could start with. Um, so we took it to the next step, which was trying to make something live that we could test inside a Gmail interface. We did this with a Chrome extension, because again, the idea is to move as quick as possible and test your ideas. At this point, there was not a lot of uh, investment in this. This was a sort of a side feature for, for our main work on, on the team. Um, and it was perceived as very high risk. So again, we wanted to move really quickly. We wanted to get a couple hundred Googlers on this. We call this fish food internally. Um, got, convinced people to install this Chrome extension. This is just a screenshot of how it worked. And it would do the type ahead, and they'd hit tab to, to accept it, more or less how it works today. Um, convinced a couple hundred Googlers to do this so we could actually start measuring our success metrics at, at more scale, rather than just sort of our intuition, which is what we've been going on before, and, and the lab study. So I want to step back for a second and just talk about our overall product process. So we start off with understanding user problems. I talked a little bit about that. It was the time people were spending in email. Um, we also, uh, I, but I kind of skipped over number two, right? Because we talked about uh, one iteration of this design evaluate build loop where we designed I showed you both the standalone website and the, the user study. We built it. We evaluated it sub subjectively. But I skipped over success, which is actually the most important part. So what should our success metric be? There's a bunch of people who design products in, uh, in, the, in this room. If you had to pick a North Star success metric for either Gmail as a whole or Smart Reply as a feature, what do you think would be a good one? 
How about this? What do you think is our North Star success metric for Gmail? Sorry, are you putting your hand up or are you just taking a photo? Do you want to give me an answer? Make it easier for the customer. That's actually basically right. <laughs> so, because if you, if there's, you, the thing there is that it, that was a somewhat of a qualitative answer, right? It was sort of subjective, like easier. What's easier? It's not seconds saved or, or, or characters saved, which we do measure. But ultimately, what we care most about on Gmail is happy users, people enjoying using the product, which is a fairly subjective thing. Um, some products are a lot more focused around, we just want time on site or we want click through rates. Um, but for Gmail, sometimes we want people to spend more time in their email if they're getting productive work done, sometimes it's less. And it's actually very, very hard to pick a good quantitative metric. So what we actually do is just ask people if they like it. We measure user happiness directly. That is what we find to be the most effective for our top level North Star metric. We of course have other quantitative metrics that we also track. This is what we actually asked for our, our surveys that we'd send out to a couple hundred people and then larger and larger populations for Smart Compose. Pretty straightforward, uh, five options of, of satisfaction. This is our SAT score. So we had our Chrome extension, had about 200 Googlers using this, sent out our first survey. We've been working on this for about two months now, uh, and we got our results. So they were 42%. Which actually, you know, there's more people happy than unhappy. So that's uh, very plus somewhat satisfied, then people are neutral in the middle, and then I guess the top 20-ish percent were people just satisfied. Um, anyone would ship this? No, no, yeah. So I, I show you the bars. So for us to start talking about shipping a feature like this that's default on for 1.5 billion users, we need to have a really high quality bar. Uh, so we knew we had a long way to go. And at this point, the, 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 the feature was definitely at risk of being, being canceled. Um, but when we dug into the user feedback, we found that there were a number of really actionable things we could try, and that gave us the motivation to say, like, hey, let's try to solve these things. We weren't at a loss of what to do and see how much impact that makes. So the first thing we learned was that speed matters. And this sounds obvious. Actually, a lot of this stuff sounds obvious, but didn't, it wasn't until we actually learned it the hard way. Um, is that, again, to go back to that distraction, if a suggestion comes in right after you've decided what you're going to write, that little sort of grading of like, oh, I was going to do this, now I have to read this, this, this text um, can be really frustrating for people. So we have to be really, really fast. Again, distraction, triggering. So what do we say when we say triggering? Well, we're not always showing suggestions. We're only showing suggestions sometimes. So what is that sometimes? Um, we always have suggestions, but we have some confidence sort of under the hood, and where we set that threshold on the confidence is, you know, when you pass the threshold, we'll show the suggestion. So that's how often we're triggering. And um, again, the triggering had to be tuned uh, quite, quite carefully to make sure they weren't distracting. This other one also sounds obvious. Longer suggestions are better, right? It's a lot more helpful to say, um, I'm just trying to make something up right now, but longer suggestions are better than high, right? Because that takes a lot longer to write. Um, fourth, people want to sound like themselves. People want to be personalized. And fifth, people needed great onboarding. So what we mean is we need to introduce people to the feature. So the way you accept a Smart Compose suggestion is with the tab key. And if you've used code editors or you just like, you know, trying things, you might find that out. But it's not super intuitive. So one thing we found, this is even internal at Google, people were just at a loss for how to use this. And it's pretty frustrating if you see the text and you don't know how to, how to accept it. So all five of these we felt like we were able to make uh, headwind on or you know, make, make progress on. So we went ahead, did all that, and we launched an internal version two. So this, what you're looking at here is the onboarding. So we had this blue call out, let people know there's a new feature. And then I don't know if you can see, but there's actually a tab key at the end of that suggestion. And that'll stay there until you actually hit the tab key twice. So we're confident the user actually knows, knows how to accept the suggestion. And this was actually built in the Gmail code base as well. So larger investment, because uh, it was built for real uh, in our system, wasn't a code, code, Chrome extension. But because it was uh, uh, built for real, we could launch it to a much bigger population. So this we actually launched to um, all of cloud in Google, which is about 20,000 people. So we addressed those five things I said before, uh, added the onboarding, and we got to 74% satisfaction in our next survey, which was a really, really, really uh, great moment. It's probably the turning point of the project because it went from this kind of small side bet to something that um, felt like it could be real. And something that's not really just captured in that number is that there were a lot of uh, really positive anecdotes. We'd get kind of random feedback of people who just said that this was a magical moment. And with AI and ML in general, I think you have opportunities to create magic moments that you don't with very uh, simple systems. So that was a very strong signal for us. 
So going from two to three, what do we do past this? We wanted to, this is sort of that last 10% that takes 90% of the time. So uh, we moved to TPUs. This is a photo of hardware. TPUs are our tensor processing units. They're um, very specialized machine learning accelerator hard drive, har hardware that lives in Google Cloud. Uh, we were actually the first feature at Google to, to use uh, the V2 TPUs at scale. And we really performance, performance on performance and quality. And quality is this really big bucket of, um, of sort of productionization that I'm going to get into. So, so uh, model quality, uh, uh, technical quality, and also a lot of edge cases I'm going to talk about. So first, I want to talk about the TPUs. So that first version that was in the Chrome extension, remember I said we learned that speed matters? It's because we were doing about 600 milliseconds uh, of latency on a single round trip. So you type, it would take us 600 seconds to go to the server and back. It's really slow. Uh, that's what led to that, that dissatisfaction due to that. Um, the magical bar tends to be around 100 milliseconds. So people have trouble perceiving any things that's faster than about 100 milliseconds. So that was our goal. Uh, we moved to TPU V1s for that, uh, the last survey results, the one that ended up 74. That got us right around that, that bar, which was great. And then, like I said, we had actually become the first feature that, that used the TPU V2s, which are the, sort of the, the newest ones. And that got us to 40 milliseconds, which was really, really, really fast. Um, so this, is, this has been a huge uh, sort of transparent improvement to the overall quality. It's, it's interesting how, just harking back to last speaker, we can really see our metrics get better as, as, as speed improves. But there are other elements to quality as well. So um, some of them are a little bit more quirky and funny, like uh, Smart Compose really likes Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's really, I don't know, I must, we must have been training this in November. Uh, but um, there was true for a while when you type the word H that it would just always say Happy Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> Smart Reply had a similar thing where it liked to say I love you when we actually had a blacklist I love you. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so, 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 so we, did, we did two cool things here. The first thing we did was, well, we just blacklist Thanksgiving. That's not that cool. But then we built uh, what's called daytime features. So what the model does now is we have uh, knowledge of the date and time in your locale, sort of what country you're in. And we can historically look at what the trends are during those, those, those times. So um, if you are on a Friday afternoon now and you write happy, it'll likely say have a good weekend. If you're in late November, it might say, Happy Thanksgiving, and so on and so forth. So we'll actually take into account uh, the, the, the place you are and the, and the time of the data. So that's, that's what we do now. Uh, but originally, we just got rid of Thanksgiving. Um, second one, and this is probably my favorite one. Uh, what do you think, this is another audience poll question, what do you think is the most common ending for emails? So the context here is the model just naively is trained on all the emails in our corpus. And it will suggest whatever is the most common thing for that context. So at the end of an email, how do most e emails end? See if anyone gets this right. I've never had somebody get this right. Thanks. Your, your name. That these are all, you're thinking like humans. Think like a computer. What is just the last string of characters at the end of a lot of emails? I'm hearing a bunch of stuff. Who's really confident? Someone say, just shout it out. Thank you. Again, very human. It is, oh, oh, after I let it up, it is sent from my iPhone. <laughs> yeah, right? Makes sense, right? It's automatically added to the end of every email. So there's a whole bunch of instances of it. Um, so of course, uh, we had to erase that. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, so that, those are the funny product quality ones. Um, there's some more serious issues, too. So. Uh, Probably, probably the 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 most interesting and difficult one that we had to challenge, we had to we had to grapple with was bias because this is a language product, right? We're putting words in people's mouth, so the suggestions that we make and the perception that people have of of our brand and our and our product are, is um, uh, it can be very personal because, like I said, we're basically putting words in your mouth, and we live in a world that's full of bias. So yeah, that some you know maybe email is biased towards sent from my iPhone. That's kind of funny, but there's also other instances of language that, that are less funny. So for example, yeah, the biases in your data are the biases in your tool. So if you're training ML models, this is going to be true, uh, whether it's a language feature or any other. So this was one of the first ones we found that made us realize we had a problem. So if you wrote Anna as an investor, and would you like to meet with Smart Compose would invariably suggest him. Um, this is, looks particularly bad because most of us know that Anna is a female name. 
And if you actually look what's going on under the hood here, is the model doesn't. Because what we do for uh, privacy protection and other, other things, before we even train, we actually erase names and uh, replace it with a token that's just, just name. So what the model sees is name is an investor. Would you like to meet with? So really, the only thing it has to go on there is investor, which it, is, it has associated more often with male pronouns. We don't want to be perpetuating uh, certain biases in the world, really any biases in the world. So we really had to figure out how we were going to address this. And to be completely honest, we didn't come up with a really great idea or a good solution, because this is kind of an unsolved problem with machine learning. So what we've done is we've just removed personal pronouns. So you cannot get Smart Compose to say the word him or her to, as of today. Um, it's interesting here that I think a lot of our innovation in this was actually in the testing, if you know, not the solution delivery. Uh, so what we ended up doing is spinning up a whole team of about 20 people that spent multiple weeks just trying to get Smart Compose to say bad things. Um, I mean, the, you, you have to at least know what you're dealing with, right? And, and we had to know this before we want to go out to the world and, 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 uh, and put our name behind this feature. Um, so that's what we did. And we luckily, one of the nice things about, um, yeah, so we got rid of the personal pronouns. One of the nice things about smart compose is we don't always have to be there. So we have this option to withdraw ourselves versus like a search result, for example. We can withdraw certain search results, but we always have to show a result. Um, so we, we had that option here, to, here so we didn't have to uh, uh, really get ourselves in hot water if we could identify the issues. Another one that you should think about is this, that outliers are guaranteed. So um, with 1.5 billion users, you know, something that happens one in a million times is going to happen on a weekly basis or something. My math not be exactly right. But things that seem really rare are still going to happen. Um, we've seen this happen with Smart Reply and Smart Compose, where um, we're going to use a Smart Reply example. We, we try to be particularly conservative where our, our pre-composed replies are, are whitelisted. So it's not free-form language generation like Smart Compose. Someone has looked at every single possible reply and said, yeah, that is safe. And that, that might, may make you sit back and be like, OK, we can let it do whatever you want. But actually, what happens is that context is really important. So you can imagine you might have something like, sure, that sounds great, or sounds fun. And that's something a smart, or a smart reply says a lot, because it tends to be very positive, um, which is generally fine. Uh, but sometimes you send emails about things that aren't awesome, right? Like maybe somebody died. Maybe some tragic event happened in the world. Um, and if that happens and there's a smart reply suggestion that's like sounds fun, that is obviously just really insensitive and not something we want to get ourselves into and, and, and we're just wrong in that case. So we actually built something called a uh, sensitive topic classifier, which is a whole separate model that runs to try to detect any sensitive topic uh, that we won't do a good job on and really we don't need to be inserting ourselves in. Um, and in that case, we simply don't run the model. So you're not going to get smart replies, you're not going to get smart compose. Uh, the other thing we've done here is just acknowledge the fact that there are the, the unknown unknowns, the famous Cheney quote, um, that we built a fast system for pushing our blacklist so that anything that we need to blacklist, we can do within five minutes globally. So there are going to be things that come up that we can't look at ahead of our time, so we have to defensively be prepared uh, to react quickly. Um, finally, it uh, turns out not everybody wants spelling or writing assistance as much as I would love it. So internally, we found that there was a vocal population who really just wanted to turn the feature off. It was small, but they're vocal. Um, so with this final feature, we also added an opt out and added that to our onboarding so people could simply opt out if they, if they didn't uh, want to use Smart Compose. That was a bit of a digression, digression but hopefully that was interesting. Um, so these are these sort of the long tail, the edge cases we had to get right, absolutely had to get right, but we weren't really, it wasn't really sort of the core of the feature like we were addressing in version two. And that's version three. We uh, brought that to the whole company internally and uh, got 82% on our satisfaction score. And so at this point, we felt like we were really had something that we could share with the world. We had done our due diligence, we'd really put it through the ringer, and we had a great satisfaction score. Um, so really proud to share this. This was in the run-up to, to Google I.O., which is Google's largest conference of the year. I think it's our longest-running conference. And uh, Sundar, our CEO, saw this and, and thought it was pretty cool. So he actually decided to uh, scoop it up into the keynote, and he launched this at May, uh, in May 2018 at Google I.O., did the whole video, talked about Smart Compose, and it was a really, uh, really great moment for the team. Because, this, like I said, this feature had came from a kind of a side bet uh, that we had just come up with, as some, uh, with, with some engineers. So launched at Google I.O., um, press hits, and I pulled, out, I pulled out this quote because it basically goes back to that first slide, which was really cool to see. 
the quote here that I highlighted, it basically like real-time autocomplete for entire emails. If you remember, that was a goal. So it was really cool to see that come through and that to be organically uh, surfaced with the, the, the press. Um, as soon as we had that done, so we, we did web first because people write more emails on web. Um, and it was really quick for us to iterate with the Chrome extension. Uh, but we wanted to get this on mobile too uh, pretty quickly. So we did a similar user study to what I had showed you at the beginning with the chips and the drop down, but for mobile. So mobile has a bunch of interesting constraints, right? So for example, mobile all already has writing assistance, right? Your keyboard will give you word assistance no matter what platform you're on. Uh, so what do you do if you know, the Apple keyboard says one word and Smart Compose says another and you know, we, can't, we can't have visibility into that? Uh, so that's one problem. Um, but there's also a lot more options, right? Because it's a soft keyboard, so we can draw it. We can draw bubbles. We can add a dedicated key to the keyboard. That's not something we can do with a physical keyboard. So we had um, new constraints and new, uh, new opportunities. We did another user study and tried a bunch of different UIs. So the first one's a bubble, which is where we float a bubble with the suggestion. Um, we had a, a swipe one to teach people the swipe action and, and had some onboarding there. Um, the suggest bar is where we actually replaced the keyboard suggestions with the Smart Compose suggestions so people would reuse the same uh, habits they had and the, the, the touch, touch targets they were used to. Um, and the final one is just accept key, which really just looks like ghost text, but it means that, that uh, bottom right blue arrow was to accept the suggestion. And I won't pull you guys here, but um, turns out, kind of similar to web, that what people want us to do is just get out of the way. So what people tried to do here, they kind of ignored what we, told, what we, what we put on the screen when they just trying to tap the suggestion. They're like, oh, the suggestion, let's tap it. And that was really interesting because it's not one way we represented, but when we watch people in the lab, we're just like, oh, that's, that's the intuitive thing. They just want to tap the suggestion. So that's the way it works today is that it's, uh, there's just ghosted text and you can either tap or swipe It'll accept the, the suggestion. We have that same uh, little swipe for the very first one, and that's it. Um, and that's how it works. We originally launched it on the Pixel 3 as an exclusive feature, so that was last fall. Um, it is now on all Gmail clients on all mobile phones, iOS and Android. That set our high watermark at 93, 93% uh, satisfaction. Um, so it turns out writing on a phone is harder than writing on a, on a, on a computer. I know it sounds obvious, but we didn't know that. Uh, and we were, we were really happy to see this. All right, so this is how the feature grew over time. Um, iterative improvement, multiple successes, uh, or sorry, multiple inc incremental successes. Uh, I don't even show the earlier ones, right, where we didn't have our SAT score. There was two iterations before this. Um, but slow and steady, we've gotten to a feature that we're all really proud of. Uh, two quotes I'm going to close on, and then I'm going to step back and talk about our general lessons. So one of the really cool things about solving such a big space or working on such a big space is that we end up solving problems that we didn't really set, seek out to address. So something that came up really clearly both in internal feedback and has now even more so externally is um, non-native speakers really, really appreciate Smart Compose. So if you're not a non-native speaker of language, you don't have as much confidence in your language. Uh, because especially idioms and that kind of like what is casual, um, it comes very natural to a native speaker, can be very challenging for non-native speakers. Um, so this is one of our first pieces of feedback that showed that to us. As a non-native speaker of English, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. I can complete my sentences. Uh, I can express myself without having to Google sample sentences. So we might be stealing some queries. Um, yeah. Anyways, and this isn't only English. We actually have uh, Smart Compose in Portuguese and Spanish and French. And uh, I was speaking to somebody who works in our Sao Paulo office in Brazil. She's from Mexico, but she's writing a lot of emails in Portuguese. And she said that it's been a huge boon to her, Smart Compose in Portuguese. So that was cool. Um, and the second one, the next one is actually probably the most touching feedback we've ever received. Um, it was an internal bug report. So it wasn't even feedback. It was actually just a bug report. It was a problem. Um, Totally blindsided us, didn't realize that we were helping with this. It's long, but I think it's worth it. Uh, Smart Compose recently stopped working for, for me. This is a very important feature for me. I have an autism spectrum disorder, which affects my ability to communicate. It is very difficult, if not impossible, for me to come up with the kind of responses that come naturally to neurotypical people. This feature proved invaluable by providing a way for me to convey my message. Um, and yeah, so this was, this was really uh, inspiring for us to see. And we actually ended up working with um, a number of groups internally that focus on accessibility and, and people who have a, a very, very, various numbers of um, 
input uh, input struggles. So that can be uh, mechanical or or uh, or, or mental. Um, so this was uh, this is kind of my last quote I wanted to end on. Um, and that's the story of building Smart Compose. I'm going to change gears here now, and I'm going to give you guys a little under the covers. I usually do this with my, design, <laughs> with my UX designer, and she does this part. Um, but she can make the trip, so I'm going to, I'm going to do her slides. Um, I, I've worked on all these features, though. So stepping back, what are some general strategies about uh, designing ML that we can, we can pick up? So uh, we want to start with our goal, always. Um, our goal as designers of AI-based AI system is to build a system that people can trust, they can understand, and they gain value from. So an example of that might be Gmail's tabbed inbox. So tabbed inbox is pretty straightforward to understand. People know uh, what social promotions and up updates are. They, um, they trust it. They know if they get an email from Facebook, that's going to be social. It's going to be there. Um, and, and it does provide a lot of value for people because it gets a lot of email out of their primary inbox uh, into somewhere else that they understand. So this is a, um, a, successful, a very successful AI feature. But I think the question is, like, how do we get there? What are the various strategies we can employ to go from a general idea or concept or technology to, to get something like this? So there are five strategies I'm going to share with you. First is choosing the right problem. Of course, uh, you always need to start with your problem. This is specific to AI, but we want to choose the type of problems that we can bring this technology to bear. Second is reinforcing the right mental model. So your mental model is the way people understand your system to work. And if I pull on a lever here, what's going to move over there? Um, this can be particularly tricky with ML systems because they aren't rule-based. So there are aspects that don't have simple cause and effect relationships. And I'll get into that in a bit more detail. Third is to leave your transparency, which is a great way to create trust. Fourth is designed for failure and bias. I mentioned this, I, I talked about this specifically in Smart Compose, but in general, your systems are going to fail. So you have to assume that they're going to fail and learn how you're, uh, uh, sorry, prepare for how you're going to deal with those failures. And then finally, there's ways to validate the UX before the model. Um, again, I touched on my, many of these in sort of that particular example of Smart Compose, but we're going to look at them in a more general sense from other features we've worked on in Gmail. So choosing the right problem. One good way to frame this to say, there's two questions. One, making sure that you're starting with um, the users first and users value. So how might we help population X accomplish goal that they want to accomplish? Uh, this is not special to ML or AI, right? This is just product development in general. Um, but the second part of the question does apply, which is how, how can artificial intelligence uniquely solve this problem? And when you have both a strong problem statement and a yes to that is when you know you're sort of in the sweet spot for uh, an intelligence-based feature. So this the example that we have on screen is a feature called nudging. Um, it might be a little subtle there. It's that green, or sorry, green, <laughs> orange, orange sentence uh, that says, received two days ago reply. So the story of this feature is actually um, some, some engineers on the team, uh, they, they kind of they came to, to, to us and they said, hey, we think we can predict when somebody didn't reply to an email that they should have. Because you have lots of examples of emails that are replied to, some that aren't. Is there anything we can do with this? And it was, so it was an example of sort of a technology first driven approach. So a lot of times people aren't filing you know, bug reports asking for nudging or saying, hey, I wish you know, the emails would write themselves. Um, but we, we thought that there was something we could do with this because we already had a list of user problems that we have prioritized within Gmail, and one of them is called dropping the ball. So people obviously get frustrated when they feel like they're either letting their coworkers down or other people have, have uh, dropped the ball when they've asked them to do something. Um, so when we're, we're looking at this question, it's like, well, uh, can we help uh, users who receive actionable email not drop the ball? Yes, we can. And can AI uniquely solve this problem? And I actually think it can here, because we have a lot of systems already, or we have a lot of tools in Gmail already to help you stop dropping the ball. We can star it, you can label it, you can snooze email, um, now you can schedule email. Uh, but the fact is, the vast majority of people just don't use those features. A small fraction of people use any manual feature. So they're all sort of opt-in, is what we think of them. When this allows us to do something is opt-out. So in the best case scenario, about 15%, like the, the most used triage feature is, is starring, and about 15% of people use starring. But we can turn this on by default for everybody. Uh, so AI gives us that power to really expand the impact and help more people uh, not drop the ball. Okay, 
in general, when can we think about AI features? There's sort of three big buckets that resonate with me. One is automating the mundane, which is something you do all the time. How do we make that quicker so you can get uh, higher value time? I think Smart Compose is a great example of that. Second is keeping you safe. So this is an example of our spam filter. Um, because we can see so many more incidences of, of issues, luckily most people don't encounter this on a daily basis, we can, do, uh, we can, we can build systems that that learn from that and, and keep you safe. And third one is, like I say, give you superpowers, which is allow you to do things that a human reasonably couldn't. For example, keeping track of every email you've ever received and ever sent in your brain so you know which ones you haven't replied to. Um, so I think nudging is a strong example of giving you superpowers. But before we jump into the AI, and this is something uh, I'm definitely personally guilty of, is we always have to ask ourselves, why not a simple system? And this is why it's important to start with user problems and success metrics and goals, because if you can accomplish your goal and meet your metrics uh, with a simple system, you should do that, right? Because it's probably going to be a lot, uh, a lot cheaper and, and be better to maintain and things like that. So when we ask people what their favorite Gmail intelligence feature is, this is often the reply we get. Do you guys know this, anyone? So this is, if you say, hey, I forgot to, you, you know, uh, thanks for your email, I see this uh, invoice attached, and you hit send. When you hit send, if there's nothing actually attached, you're going to get a pop-up that says, hey, you forgot to attach something. Seems super smart. A great example of uh, keeps you safe, right? Got, uh, watching your back. Um, this was built by an intern in 2007 in one week. Um, it is... I think two or three lines of code. It, it's basically, it looks for different, mo uh, different variants of the word attached, and if there's no attachment, it's, it does a pop-up in the browser. That's all it is. Uh, but it's a great feature, and people still talk about it. OK, so the next strategy, first one was picking the right problem, the second one is reinforcing the right model. So again, this is, can be difficult with, with ML features because there isn't always a sort of simple cause and effect relationship. Um, so again, this is a slide I stole from Annika, who I, who I usually work with. And this is an actual screenshot she took. Um, when you set high expectations for the model that you're going to be encountering, people are going to assume that it has all its capabilities on models. So for example, if you create a humanoid bot, people are going to expect it can do all the things humans can do. It's obviously not actually a human under the hood. Um, OK, so one of the things we do to ask people uh, to make sure that they have the right mental models, we just ask them. Again, we really like user studies, qualitative user research in our culture in Gmail. Um, and one of the things we want people to be able to tell us is that priority inbox gets better uh, when I correct it. That is part of the mental model that we want to reinforce. So we ask people that, and hope, hopefully we hear that. And one of the ways we do that in the product, so you can do that with onboarding, right? You can say, hey, this is how the feature works. The fact is, most people don't read onboarding. And and people tend to forget things if they've only seen it once. So the way we reinforce it in the product is that, uh, so Pretty Inbox, for those of you who don't use it, it has an important email, uh, an important section for emails that appear to be important, and an unimportant section. And these yellow flags uh, that all important emails are, have this yellow flag, and if you unclick it, it immediately drops out into the unimportant section. So people sort of learn that cause and effect relationship that, oh, this yellow flag means it's important, and I can control that. And because I control it, it gets better over time. So the third strategy is leveraging transparency. Um, there's lots of different ways you can do transparency in machine learning. You can show model confidence. Uh, you can talk about the data it was trained on. You can talk about if personal data has been trained on. A um, couple examples of this. This is actually from Google Maps. Um, yeah, the your match score. So this is showing the model confidence. It, it, Google Maps is making some recommendations. Uh, and Obviously, I really like noodles, um, so I'm 100% matched with uh, Chang An, uh, or does a noodle shop? The way we do it on Gmail, and this is this is actually a, a, a this is I think an interesting topic of when transparency is needed. So I kind of call this nouns versus judgments. So nouns might be tabbed inboxes in. A, something that is a promotion is an update. People have a pretty good model. So did I? Did someone ask a question? No. Oh, sorry, I thought I heard something. Okay, never mind. Just me. Um, OK, so people know what a promotion is. They know what an update is. You know, you, you get it in your mailbox. It feels like a tangible thing. It's a noun, right? Um, a judgment might be something like important. Like, I judge your email to be important. And one way we found to sort of think about this is if, if, human, if you could trust a human stranger to do this on your behalf, um, then you're more likely to trust the system. If you're not, then you're going to be skeptical of it. So someone who doesn't know me at all, are they really going to know what email is important and isn't? 
Probably not. I'm gonna be a little skeptical of that uh, to, for, for them to be able to make that judgment. So because of because of that skepticism, this type of judgment-based recommendation needs more transparency. So part of the way we do that is we have uh, there there are a number of factors that, that factor into the model, and we, we, we surface those whenever possible. So for example, if you mouse over on those flags, you, you get a, a reasoning for why uh, this email has been deemed important. This is really tricky, though, because the truth is this is not always the reason, because it's kind of a black box. Because uh, we will the, the way the model works is we're, we're, we're training on a large data set of emails that have been acted upon, and we don't know exactly why that email has been acted upon. So what we've actually done is there are certain scenarios where it is clear, you know, it's from somebody you contact frequently, it's a, you're in the two line. Um, and we have sort of a ghost model, if you call it that, that is a bunch of rules, and they go from a more specific one to the most general, which is just looks important. And that's what we'll put in this, um, in this uh, mouse over. Fourth category, designing for failure and bias. I already talked uh, a lot about the, the bias approaches or bias testing approaches we did in Smart Compose. Um, I just want to talk about some general categories of way things go wrong. So your model can have low confidence, but you have to show results anyways. You can have high confidence, and you're like, yeah, we totally got this, and you're wrong. So that would be a false positive. You have false positive and false negatives. You have training data problems. So in a way, bias is a training data problem, but more generally, um, just the way the way it's set up on Gmail is that it's it's easier for us to uh, train on consumer data versus enterprise data, but we build G Suite for enterprise systems. So, for example, there may be a lot of sort of more consumer language or consumer patterns on our training data, and then when we deliver that feature, we're delivering it to a workplace use case, and and that doesn't always match properly. Uh, so we can fail in that those scenarios. Um, maybe a really good example of that is the I love you or the like very very exuberant smart reply, which is maybe pretty cool, like LOL in your personal life, but in a lot of people's workplace, that's not appropriate. So we're suggesting smart replies that um, don't fit. And that is a uh, training data problem. And, and bias is another one. Um, one way we can do this is reduce pressure on perfect results. Uh, so smart reply has the luxury of being wrong, right? We really only have to get one out of three right here. Um, another thing we do is if all smart replies are positive, or, or negative, they're almost never all negative, um, we'll insert a positive or a negative to give some diversity because we don't need three different options to say yes. Am I at end of time? No, oh, okay. I only, I have 45 minutes, right? Yes, okay, I have one minute. All right, we're gonna zoom through this. Offer escape hatches, test being wrong. This is an interesting one where this is a good, this, is, this just looks like a spam email, but what we did is we brought people into the lab and actually asked them uh, who their legitimate email providers are, and then put a spam banner on it. So that what would happen if we showed someone a legitimate email with a spam banner on top? So we can see that we're not, um, we're able to be wrong even when we have high confidence. So we believe this to be a spam email. Sometimes we're going to be wrong, and in those cases, we want people to be able to get out of that situation. Um, and finally, validating the user experience before the model. Um, this is an interesting one where we were thinking of creating a top picks in the promotions tab. Um, before we go ahead and building that, we would actually ask people to share with us the type of promos they're interested in and would customize, make screens for them that had those at the top, and then we could run them through those journeys in the lab. Um, so it's called Wizard Oz because it's sort of the man behind the, the, uh, the curtain. So it can feel to the user like they're, building, they're using a real product when we give them the screen. But what we've actually done is customized it manually behind the scenes so uh, it looks like it is more, it looks like there's more intelligence there than there is. It allows us to sort of isolate the user experience from the model because we can essentially have a perfect model because uh, we've done it manually. Um, another way to do that is slightly more sophisticated is to actually build scripts. So we did this when we were uh, sort of the other side of the promos side is sometimes people don't open their promos. So we um, had a, a, a script that identified stuff that people were not opening and, and, and suggested to unsubscribe from them. And we did that by uh, just running a script on a person-by-person -person basis, and, uh, and that would surface the uh, emails that should be unsubscribed from. So in summary, these are the five strategies we recommend uh, that have been really helpful for us on Gmail and building AI products. Uh, we choose the right problem. You can think of that as, should I ML this? These are my sort of questions to go with. Um, you got to reinforce the right mental model, which is this idea of like, how would a stranger explain it? Could you trust someone who you don't know to be able to uh, do this on your behalf? Um, third is, what would it take to trust this? How do you leave transparency? 
Fourth, what could possibly go wrong? Things are going to go wrong, so you should prepare for that. And finally, uh, ask yourself how you can test as soon as possible to save your engineers and really your business as much time and, and, uh, and effort as possible. All right, I think that's everything. So thank you. Uh, thank you for all this. I, don't, I think I have time for questions, but yeah. It's, do, do we have questions? No? I sure hope so. That was way before my time. The question was, did the uh, attachment intern get a job? I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. That was way, way before my time. Uh, who do you use as your do you do oh. Who do you use as your testing audience on early stages? Are they Googlers? Uh, both. Uh, both Googlers and um, external users. So. Um, we're, we, have, we have a great luxury that we have a dedicated user research team, and they have recruiters who are constantly working to recruit people for the feature we're building. So for example, if it's an enterprise-focused feature, they're going to be reaching out ahead of time to a number of our customers, asking them if, if they'd like to come into the lab. If it's a more consumer feature, uh, they're going to be putting out recruitment surveys. To be honest, I'm not even exactly sure where they do it, but usually it's, it's local people, uh, or sometimes we'll do it remote. Um, but we're also testing frequently on internal Googlers as well. So. Um, that if you go back to the Smart Compose example, that uh, that first the Chrome extension one was was pretty quick, and that was only internal. And do you feel like uh, you're getting biased by who you choose as your testing audience? I mean, you certainly are, but it actually seems to, it's it surprised me many many times how uh, how predictive these small groups are from the actual results. Uh, especially Googlers, we like to think that we're uh, a little bit different or, or special, but we're not. Like Our behaviors are very, very similar to what actually happens once we launch it. So they, it's, we're actually lucky that it's a pretty good predictor. And Paul, one more yeah. over there. Um, the time it took um, from V1 to V3 to launch, what, what did that time period look like through testing and then finally to launch? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So a little under a year from the very first proposal to launch, uh, the longest stage was V3, was all that bias testing and sort of crossing our T's and dotting our I's. How long to get to uh, basically a, a viable, you validated it? I think it depends what you call viable. So after V2, when we hit the 74% satisfaction, is when we knew there was something there, and we were able to invest a lot more in bringing it up to, to, to par. But, but I would like to think that at every stage, we had some significant milestone. Like that first one, we to tell them what um, experience. And we knew we'd have a user experience set, like a, a UX that could work. So every, every, every step should have you know, so milestones. How oh, how long? Um, every step takes longer than the last one. Right, so we were able to iterate in like weeks, and then so I, I I don't remember off the top of my head to be completely honest. I'd say that last the last V three was probably four to five months, and the first stage probably took two weeks. Cool. Yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, uh, after V one, you had a satisfaction rate of forty two percent. Right. And also a risk of uh, feature getting canceled. You mentioned. Yeah. And all you had was key learnings. Yeah. How did you um, manage to? Launch it on twenty thousand Google Cloud customers with you know only key learnings and and a risk of getting scratched. What, what did you do? So I should clarify that wasn't customers. It was twenty thousand employees. Yeah, yeah internal. Uh, so we wouldn't do that with customers. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, I think everyone wanted this to work, and we had had a success with Smart Reply. Um, also, at the time, we had an executive sponsor who really, really kind of was hoping this was going to work. So I think that helped a lot to sort of provide air, air cover. Um, honestly, this is just sort of the, the, a lot of my job is actually sort of this, sort of like managing the expectations and the, and the, and the so I don't have a really good answer other than um, asking for about two, more, two months more of faith and then saying, hey, we have things we can do and sort of getting the right people uh, to believe in the vision. All right, that's it. Thanks.